All right. Welcome back once again to the CFB Paint Podcast. Today you got Steve, Brian, and Corey. Um, we're going to talk about a few different things today. We're going to talk about height teams. We're going to talk about the NBA Finals have just started. We're going to talk about how that relates to football a little bit, some of our best experiences in stadium, and then some tips that we both have or we all have for surviving the offseason. So let's start off with some of the our hype teams. Brian, can you list off some of the teams that you've heard about their hype? And then let's talk about whether we buy into them or not. Yeah, so so some teams that uh, fan bases – do you want me to give a long list or just kind of go one by one and we'll check in? Let's go by conference. Okay, so let's start off in the SEC. Uh, the powers that be for a long time has been Alabama, Georgia, and say long time. Long time been Alabama. For the recent history, it's been Georgia. Uh, but LSU breaks through last year, make it to the conference title game. They beat Alabama. And we're expecting uh, bigger things in year two under Brian Kelly. The other team that broke through last year was Tennessee. They also have a big win over Alabama. Um, they don't get the win over Georgia, but by all means have a, have a big year under Josh Heupel. Hendon Hooker is a, you know, a Heisman contender for much of the season until his injury comes around. And they're not expecting, or I should say the fandom isn't expecting huge drop off with uh, Joe Milton taking over. So LSU Tennessee would be the, the big two hype teams of the S Southeastern conference. So you buying them, Steve? I'm buying LSU. I'm putting a lot of chips on the table there. I think I was the one who, in our you know postseason expectations for 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 who could potentially make the playoff this next year, I, I think I was the person who put LSU at four. Number one, I think they've got the defensive playmakers to do it. They lost their star defensive tackle in like I think the first or second series of the Florida State game last year. Harold Perkins hadn't quite emerged just yet. But they, they have playmakers all over the board. The secondary is the one thing that gives me a little bit of pause, but I also believe they're going to have the offensive firepower to bail them out if their defense on the back end isn't able to hold up in some of those games where they are facing overly potent offense. Yeah, um, I look at LSU myself, um, and I – so Brian Kelly, I feel like his history has been – pretty good as a coach during the regular season. Then he kind of stumbles as the postseason goes. Um, granted, he didn't have the talent that, at Notre Dame that he has out here at LSU. But I look at last year and I look at the, some of the stumbles or some of the struggles with the games, like Arkansas, a close game against Arkansas, a loss against Texas A&M. They're kind of in a show-me state. I'm not quite sure I buy the hype yet, but I'm also not – like I still think they're a 10-win a season, 10-win team. I don't know if they're a playoff team yet. Um, I bet I, – I think – what what he did what they did last year is probably what I expect this year. I didn't expect it last year, but I expect it this year. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs per se, but I I don't think that they are going to blow it away. Brian, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I'm buying LSU. Um, I uh, Stephen mentioned the 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 danger on the back end of that defense, but the one thing that makes me um, kind of lean in and away from some of these hype teams is does your season get upended by a single injury? And I don't think that happens for them. I, you know, I, obviously a Harold Perkins going down would be disadvantageous. You know, that's, that's perhaps the best player or the best defensive player in the sec. Um, but a lot of the time it's a quarterback that goes down. That will matter. And this will make a difference. Um, yeah. Jaden Daniels looks to be the starter. I think he probably deserves it. He's, he's a good player. Garrett Musnire, Nussmeyer looks really good. So, and, and I think they have receivers to, who will enjoy it if that, you know, were to happen, you know, not, not that they're hoping the worst for Jaden, but, Oh, we're going to sling around the ball a little bit more. Uh, Malik Davis can make big plays. Mason Taylor is only going to grow from strength. He was a freshman last year and, and down the stretch of the season became more and more of a target. Uh, I, I think they have a little bit more depth than some of these other hype teams. Uh, that exception being, they just overhauled their secondary because it's all gone. It's all transfer portal people. And, and, Prospects who we thought were going to be really good, like Denver Harris, um, that we now need to see the production on the field. Uh, and they'll need to see it early on as they have an early test against Florida State. But I, I'm buying the hype for LSU. I, I have them – I mean, we're way out now and things can still change, but I, I have them going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Alabama and I you know, favor them to, to get them again. Yeah. Um, what about Tennessee, Steve or Brian? What do you guys think about Tennessee? Yeah, I, I think – I need to see Joe Milton do it for more than just four quarters is, Agreed, is the yeah. real thing. Uh, again, that's one where I got a true freshman guy that can sling it. So um, and that we're talking about 
Nico um but so I, I think you're right, Brian. I think that they're one that maybe a, an injury wouldn't necessarily, or an injury at the quarterback position wouldn't derail their season either. I, I just, I think I got to see a little bit more from their defense and I need to see if, if Joe Milton is ready for prime time. Excellent. If he's not, is Nico ready right out of the gates or does he need a couple of games to really find his feet? And so I, when it says, when you say buy into him, I, I don't know what their win total is. Um, I want to say it's nine, but I don't know. I'll, off the top. I'll that check sounds on it. right to me. Eight, anywhere between eight, eight and a half, and nine sounds sounds about right. So I, I am, you know, I, do I think they'll break through and be a playoff team? No, I, I don't think they will. So uh, anywhere between eight and nine wins sounds right to me. I think seven would be a disappointment. I think ten would be an excellent season for the Volunteers. Yeah, so I'm in a similar. Go, no, Brian. Yeah. I'm in a similar state of mind as Steve here. I I mean, I, I think 10 would be an excellent, but also kind of expectation. If you look at their schedule, I expect them to drop to Alabama and to drop to Georgia. And I favor them in every other game. And that doesn't mean you can win every other game. Obviously, you know, that's just not how it goes. But I, I'm buying Hypel, not buying Tennessee in 2023, if that makes sense. I think he's got this program going in the right direction. I think there's legit legitimate hype in the recruiting ranks and in the transfer portal and the things that they do. And then there should be, I just, uh, I, with Steve, I agree that I don't see them breaking through and winning the ASCC, winning the East or making it to the playoff in this year. So the line for Tennessee is nine and a half. Okay. We're going to do DraftKings. I need to look at their schedule, but I, 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 I can give you a quick read off. So yeah, read it. Virginia at home, Austin P at home. Win. win. Away at the Gators. Away. UT San Antonio at home. Win. At, at home versus South Carolina. Win. By, by week and then at home versus Texas A&M. At Win. Alabama. Loss. At Kentucky. Win. At home against UConn. Win. At Missouri. Probably a win. Home for Georgia. Loss. And home against Vandy. Win. I think so it's a pretty nine and three. I went nine yeah. and three. Is that right? That's ten. I, I, yeah. 10 if, three, if, if you three, if you gave Texas A and M the the win there, you went yeah. nine and three. Um. So again, I, I buying the hype. I guess if the hype is the the win total, I I, I think that's far cry from what the hype is. The hype is what the potential is. So I'm not yeah, buying yeah. the potential. Um. I buy the win total. I think it's it's a really good really good line they've set. Same. For for just a, for FYI, LSU is also at nine and a half. I think I, I think I'm not buying either one like making it to the playoff, but I think that they'll be eight, nine win I mean they'll be nine, ten win teams. Yeah. So all right, let's go to moving ACC. On, Brian? Yeah, moving from on from the SEC, we've got the ACC and there's really only one hype team that we want to talk about. Clemson's in there year in, year out. It's not a hype team. We've seen them in the playoff a lot. They win the conference most years. Florida State, though, is getting, you know, some of these way too early rankings are having them top three, top four, top five. What do we think about the Seminoles? We're all Tallahassee natives. What, what do we have coming up in 2023? Well, if you watched, uh, who was it? The former uh, Notre Dame quarterback on Fox TV the other day talking about how nobody outside of Florida State typing Florida State. Um, it's only people that from Florida State. I thought it was kind of funny. Although I'm like being a Florida State fan, I'm a little cautious on this. I mean. We Florida State had a lot of luck last year with the fact that Travis wasn't hurt very often, um, and they managed to survive the one game that Travis was hurt. Granted, they have an easier schedule. I think you have four wins or four games that you're like, all right, let's see where this goes. Maybe a fifth if you count the Louisville game. Um, and then, and by that I'm saying like LSU, Clemson, their two rivalries, Miami and Florida, and then the Louisville game. I know they're expected to win against Miami and in Florida, but I. I I don't think this team is quite ready to go the next step. I feel like this is like a 2013, 2014 Clemson team where it's like they weren't quite there. Or they still had Florida State end their way. And they were like, they had that, they did that amazing thing where they went around the stadium 15 times and they had all the highs and crazy. And then they got blown out 53 to, to six or something like that. Uh, that's not going to happen to Florida State. They're not going to get blown out like that. But they do have the firepower on offense. But I just don't see this team quite 
going the way we want it to all the way there. Um, so no, I'm not buying the hype on Florida State right now. Yeah, I, I'm close, uh, but I'm not. Uh, so th- there's two things you have. So you have the LSU and Clemson games that are the ones you you got to win, and if you split those, you're fine because the ACC yep. is moving away from divisions. You have a chance to get revenge on Clemson in the ACC title game uh, should that matchup come back up, uh, which I think the ACC is hoping it will. That's why they're having them play in September. Um, but as I, as I noted with – go ahead. I think if you split those games, you cannot lose another game for the rest of the season. And no, absolutely true. Absolutely true. You can still win the ACC, but you can't, can't make it to the playoff with two losses in the regular season with Florida State's schedule, I think. Sorry. Repeat that. I was – I'm saying if you split Clemson and, and – and LSU, you cannot lose another game and make it to the playoffs. Agreed. Agreed. What I think you could potentially do is could you beat LSU, lose to Clemson, avenge the loss to Clemson in the ACC title game? I think yeah. that's probably I think the that's a playoff berth. Path. I think yeah. if you go 11 and 1 with your loss to LSU, you may be in trouble still. Depending no, I think I think if you win the ACC and you have one loss to LSU and you I beat Clemson you twice. Make it in. Yeah. I yeah. think it depends on what LSU does. I think I think you're then beholden to that game where yeah. if they go nine and three. Maybe, but say, I, right, I also think well, historically the champion is not as good as uh, you know as our I, I also think historically the, the ratings have done a poor job of recontextualizing teams that you beat, you know. So that LSU game will be a top ten matchup. Good point. And if LSU ends up not in the top twenty five people are still going to remember it as a top 10 matchup. I think that's oftentimes how it goes. It's wrong in my opinion, but I well, think and one lost still teams, play generally fine. speaking, make it to the playoff. That's true. There aren't a lot of one loss teams that we've seen not make it. So, uh, but, but for me, the stumbling block is uh, I talked about LSU having some depth. Jordan Travis goes down. These are not reasonable goals. These are not things that FSU can achieve. Outside of him, they have the best depth they've had in years. You know, they have quality offensive linemen behind their offensive linemen, which usually they didn't have them to start in the first place. Um, they have an okay wide receiving core. The one other position I'd say is uh, linebacker is a dangerous one. If you have a, an injury or two, they have two really solid starters there. The quality behind is uh, a little bit lower. Questionable. Uh, well, questionable. That, that should be what I say. Because I think, you know, there's a chance somebody comes in and surprises you. They've made improvements in spring and fall camp. Um, but I think there's just too many variables where this could go wrong. I it, obviously, and for any of these teams that we're talking about, the way it could be paved and it could go just right. Um, I, I don't have Florida state quite breaking through there. I think maybe a, another year being little brother to Clemson, uh, another year, not uh, in a new year six or not in the, uh, playoff. Obviously I hope for, for things to be the best, but that that's what I see for the season. Steve, you've been awfully quiet over there. Do you disagree with us? I, I I see that potential. Um, again, they're kind of right there with LSU in my mind in that I think I said this on previous podcasts where I think both teams improved throughout the season. Uh, I think LSU got better than Florida State did. I think it improved at a more rapid rate. My thing, just kind of like Brian mentioned, I think they're, from a depth perspective, maybe not quite as built for a long, you know, slog to, to the playoff. So that part uh, gives me pause. If you could guarantee me the health of all 22 starters for, you know, all of the games leading up to the playoff. Yeah. I'd say that they are, I'd say they finish in the top six of the playoff rankings. I don't know if it's four. I don't know if it's in, um, but I think you're catching Clemson at a, at a good time in the year. I think that's only so much time for Garrett Riley to get the offense, uh, all the kinks worked out. And really, if you've looked at Clemson's early schedule outside of Duke, which that one might be a feisty game. That one could be a fun one to start the season. But outside of that, they don't really have even a, a minor test um, until Florida State comes to town. Now, the advantage is you get them at home. Uh, but – I don't know. Like, I don't know if Death Valley quite has the same teeth that it used to. I mean, two years ago, Florida State went in there and almost won that game with a horrendous team. So yeah, that's true. I I I I, I, I go back and forth on what what to expect for Florida State this year. 
I think that they can get to the playoff. I am not predicting it at this point, but I yeah. see why they're being hyped. Maybe I'm just a little cautious as as a fan, emotionally investing in that hype. <laughs> I, I feel like Florida State has great firepower. Like they have that offense has the potential to just light people up. Now you're at a disadvantage of the fact that games are gonna be have less plays and stuff like that, so you can't put a distance between your defense as much. Um so Mike Norvell has always been a I'm gonna outscore you kind of person. And this offense is built to do that. Now, if it can remain healthy, they have a chance. If it doesn't remain healthy, they have no chance, um, in my opinion. So Yeah, we'll have to see. It'll be they they've got depth at certain places. So if they had an injury, again, knock on wood, cross our fingers at running back. I feel okay. Even at the wide receiver position, I think I feel pretty yeah. okay. Um, offensive line, feel pretty good. Tight end, a little more nervous about. Quarterback, absolutely nervous about. And on the defensive side of the ball, defense bend is the one that is the big, big concern for me. If you have one of your starters get injured and miss significant time, uh, that that one would, would hold them back from reaching their ultimate goals in 2023. All right. Want to move on, Brian, to the Big Ten? Yeah, Big Ten. We, we've we seen this clash of Ohio State-Michigan, but the uh, a team who had a really good season last year and who some are, are pipping to to break up the duo, Penn State. Drew Alar steps in as the quarterback, or at least we are all assuming that he'll take over the reins there. Um, you have Nick Singleton. Singletary? Singleton. Singleton uh, had an Singleton, awesome yep. freshman campaign at running back. He's back again. Um, and Manny Diaz has had that defense going pretty well. A lot of people thinking this is the year Penn State can, you know, stake their claim in the in the Big Ten East and, and to the conference as a whole. Do you want to start kick off, us off with your thoughts? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I, I got to see it from Drew Alar before I give it to him. I, I, I think that, and the nice thing is that number one, I think. I need to relook at their schedule, but I, I think that they've got some time to get him acclimated where he won't be asked to go out and win a game. And I still think even in, in their biggest games, they probably won't try and, and put the game on his shoulders so much as they'll lean on that run game and their strong defense if they can. Um, I I just don't see it. Like It'd be awesome if it happened. I kind of am sort of selfishly pulling for Penn State to, to – make some noise just because I think it makes things more interesting than the kind of Ohio state. Okay. Now Michigan's on a little bit of a run. I'd love some variety. It's uh, that's, that's kind of the, the spice of life for me. So uh, I, I'd like to see it. I, I think we might be a year early on it. I think next year they could potentially be quite formidable with him as a third year sophomore or is he a true freshman? Excuse me. Um, no, you no, know, he played last year, right? Drew Alar. Yeah, I think he played a little bit last year. I think he's. I think he might have. Excuse me. Yeah, so I think he he yeah, might still have retained his red shirt though. That's the, oh yeah. So he's a third year sophomore next year, and and then you have two junior running backs in in a money year. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, maybe that defense isn't quite able to reload. I know that this year is is kind of a crescendo for the defense on particularly on the defensive line. So. We'll see. It, it, maybe they're maybe they're a year ahead of schedule. I, I think the hype is a year ahead. This one feels like a like a Texas in twenty twenty two to me. Hmm. Let's see if that. See I'm, if I'm that looking holds. at it. it. According to Penn State, he was a true freshman last year, okay. but he appeared in ten okay. games, so, so he'll be a, a true sophomore. Got it. So yeah, I, I, I'm on the same um, page. I I don't see Penn State breaking up the you know, the bigger two in the conference. Uh, Michigan returns a lot of its, or not a lot of its production, but a lot of key players. Um, no, Michigan returns like 85%. They're like the third highest production returning team in the nation. Yeah. Uh, this, and especially, you know, they're bringing back their quarterback, they're bringing back both of that running back tandem, which we all thought Blake Corum was gone. Uh, he gets injured late in the season. Now he's, you know, wants to prove that he's uh, worth the high pick that potentially could be spent on him. Um, a lot of known commodities at Michigan. Ohio State is the one that has more unknown. They're they're bringing in uh, transfer tackles. Um, they're they're losing good good people on that O line. Uh, McCord, most people are expecting to step in at quarterback, but whoever is the quarterback has awesome tools 
to work with. Like Buka and Harrison are both back. You also have um, who's the IMG kid? That's that's would have been a, re- a freshman last year, Connell Tate, who some people think yeah. are gonna is gonna step up. If not this year, then next. Um, a really talented player. Um, and Travion Henderson, if he can get anything back to what he was not last year but the year before, um, that's gonna be a terrifying offense if I was running it uh, at quarterback. So the I, I think between the returning known commodities of Michigan and the extremely high talent profile of the Ohio State roster, I, I can't see Penn State um, uh, surpassing either of them this year. Yeah, my, my thought process is, is is along the same lines. The returning talent is is an issue. If you put Steven as quarterback at OSU, they'd still win eight games. Like, let's be real. Woo! I, I mean, if Start you put the me, they'd win seven. But, you know, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but passes all the way. I'll, I'll, that's all I got to do with Harrison, man. <laughs> just <laughs> over the top. Um, just a small little thing. Um, but it, honestly, like, I have I, I get to see James Franklin really show that he can really get over the hump. Manny Diaz has kind of been the same way as a defensive coordinator for me. He can't quite always get over the, the hump against the great teams. And so I need – it's a prove it to me, show it to me thing. Um, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. But I do agree with Steven. I think next year that team might have a chance to just be amazing. So anybody else out of the Big Ten we want to talk about, Brian? No, I think that's the main one. Um, if we are feeling real spicy, we could say Wisconsin year one with Luke Fickle, but I don't think anybody's really – touting them to win the conference or go that far. So I'd say we'll, we'll stick with just Penn state for the high teams there. Gotcha. Let's go uh, big 12. Big 12. I only picked one. Um, and let me know if, if you think anything should be added to this, but the Texas Longhorns. So the only, only big 12 name I hear thrown around in playoff talks for the most part, uh, had a, a up and down season last year. They had some, some really good moments and some moments where you go, can Quinn years throw a football? Um, but we, we know how talented he can be. We saw what his, his the best of him looks like. Uh, can he produce that consistently? And then the, there is just overall on that team a lot of talent. You're losing B. John Robinson, who was maybe the best offensive player in the country um, at any position last year. Um, no offense, Caleb Williams. But you still have a, a loaded roster. You've got Xavier Worthy, who hopefully can find some consistency catching the ball because he cannot be guarded by anybody that I've seen. What do you guys think about the Longhorns? I think the Longhorns – I, I said Florida State has a, some of the best uh, firepower. I think the Longhorns are like the next team that with them that has amazing firepower. That wide receiver core is going to be absolutely unreal. My biggest issue is is I do not have faith in Sarkeesian to win you games all the time. Sometimes I feel like you lose games because Sarkeesian's game plan. He doesn't adapt it. Um, like, for instance, he should have let, leaned on Robinson a lot more in some of those games that last year. And so I want to buy the hype. For my friends, I really want to buy the hype, um, but I'm not quite there. I'm still in the show me, I, dude. I'm not. I'm sitting on the fence on all these, but at the same time, like I need to buy a few of them. So I'm. I'm not going to buy this guy. These guys yet, though. I will buy them in as far as they can win the conference, and and I'll give you one more. I think they beat Bama in Tuscaloosa. Um, I think they are. You're right. There's there's times where Sarkeesian goes so far away from the ground game that is productive. It's not even. I want to go back and do this and maybe like follow up in in like a tweet or something or on our next episode. But I feel like there's been times where he's abandoned the run game and he hasn't been forced to. Just his preference is to throw the football. Yeah. And and at times it's come back to bite him where it's like well, we're halfway through the third quarter. Bijan Robinson has seven touches. That is a problem. That'd be something that I would have one of my staff, like it is your job to notify me if he doesn't have X number of carries by this point, these points in the game, right? You should have at least three midway through the first quarter. He should have at least so many through the, through the second and and so on and so forth, just to make sure that we're getting the right balance um, and, and leaning on our stars. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, that's that kind of uh, the counterpoint to that that I am arguing in my head about is like, well, is he that big of a loss if you weren't fully utilizing him? Perhaps? Yeah. And you're leaning on your stars now, which are your wide receivers and your quarterbacks. You're right. And so I, I can see it kind of going both ways. Um, I, I don't know, like w- with Texas, I feel like I wake up every day and I feel a little bit differently about them. Um, but it, when we're talking about QB depth, 
my goodness. Like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> when Arch Manning so, is looking like your QB number three, you know you're doing well, doing all right. Oh yeah, so I, I think that they could withstand some injuries at, at key positions. I think that offensive line is going to be maybe the best in the country. I think it, it, for my money, I can't find many that are going to be better. Perhaps Alabama's, Georgia's. It's it's a debate and one that would be fun to follow as those players go throughout their collegiate and NFL careers to see. Looking, I think hindsight would be helpful in that, but they've got some real talent on that offensive line as well. So um, they're another team. I feel like all these teams that are being hyped are teams that in a pinch can, can score 55 if they need it to win a game. So, um, And that's a real X factor to have if you're a hype team. If, if, you, if you're wanting to do something next year, it's like, well, there's always the chance that we just uh, don't get stopped almost the entire game, and that'll win you just about any ball game. Uh, ask Georgia against TCU. Um, I'm not to get us on too much of a tangent here. Just want a, a quick, Steve, you have uh, LSU and Texas beating uh, the Crimson Tide next year. Yeah. That's, that's like you noted. <laughs> it, those were the two that you buy. And I was, I was curious. Like, we didn't put Alabama, Alabama on this LSU list. Needs the win, you know, needs the win in Tuscaloosa to, you know, for me, for me, buying the hype is conference championship slash playoff. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, that's where I, I, I couched the Texas pick. I don't think they're a playoff team. I think it's mostly because they'll find a way to stumble over themselves. They always do. Um, but I do see them winning the Big 12. I, uh, I, and I'll... No, I, 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 I... Let me bring it home. Go ahead. Let me bring it home here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so do I have them both winning? I, I reserve the right to change my mind on this. At this point... Of course. Yeah, I think I do. I think I do. Yeah, obviously, like no predictions made in Bama. No, no predictions made in June are, are things that you have to hold up to uh, come September, October, when you know the roster's a little bit better. You understand uh, injuries that have occurred or players who have already opted to transfer. Um, that is interesting. I, I don't have uh, Texas beating Alabama, and I'm not buying the Texas hype uh, because of my lack of faith in Sarkeesian, similar to Corey. I think you look at not only the Alabama game, but you have Texas Tech, Kansas State, and a, an Oklahoma team who gets you at home and is coming off of some of the biggest embarrassment they've had in that series in history. I think between those games, there, there's an opportunity for more than a couple slip-ups. Um, I'm not totally out on them, the possibility of them winning the conference title, but I am out on them winning it in a fashion that would make them a playoff contender where, where they really have a reasonable grab at the end of the season. Yeah, I think ten and two. Ten and two in the regular season. Yeah, I'd say throw another loss in there for me. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm along that lines. Um I mean, if Sarkeesian is able to to do what he's supposed to, like I feel like these teams are all so many of these teams are like if they can live up to the hype. There is hype, but like it's and, completely and it, it's, unproven hype. Yeah, it, it's warranted hype. It's you know, based on talent or based on flashes. Um, yeah, it's just what, what can solidify. Yeah. Agreed. Um, what other are we missing? Pac 12? Pac 12. Uh, we've got two big year two coaches in the Pac 12 USC coming off of, uh, losing then the Pac 12 title to Utah. Um, and what, what was that look, Steve? I just think there's three. You got USC, Washington, and perhaps even Oregon. We can talk about that. Uh, I guess, Steve, how many people have you seen say Oregon's making the playoff this year? Predict it? Not many. Um, but I, I hear them on, like, kind of in the same breath that I hear Florida State and LSU as, as playoff contenders. I have not heard them in the same breath because I keep hearing LSU and Florida State as, like, the dark horses to make the playoff. I don't hear that for Oregon. I don't hear Oregon even expected to win the Pac-12. Now, do I believe that they might? I'm pretty big on Oregon. I'm pretty big on Dan Landing, to be honest. Um, I, but I don't hear other people saying that for the for the most of it. Um, yeah, I have to look back and and read some of the, find some of the articles that I've been reading, but and and people that I've been listening to. But I, I think I've heard them kind of as a, as a fringe team. You're right, not yeah. with the same fervor that Florida State and LSU get. Yeah, uh, but but another insane. second year coach in the Pac-12 who had an impressive opening campaign. You know, these are three of the powers of the entire conference last year, 
and it's all coming from fresh new blood. Caleb Williams, the Heisman winners or Heisman, yeah, trophy winners back for another season. Michael Penix is back. Bo Nix is back. So all of them get elite quarterback play. Um, if it's replicable from last season, returning uh, with the rest of their team. I guess who who of these we'll throw Oregon in the mix. What, what hype should we be buying here? Because we can't buy all three. All right, I'm buying Washington and I'm buying Oregon. I, Washington has a, a re, amazing returning talent. Their offensive coordinator uh, got asked to come over to Alabama and said, mm, "I'm out. I'm staying here at Washington." Like they've got an opportunity to to be amazing. And then Dan Lanning has shown that he understands how to let an OC run his offense and how to run a team and get him to buy in. I mean, you did it with Bo Nix last year and you're pretty darn good. And no offense, like Bo Nix isn't an all-star, but he played well for you. And I expect him to play well for you again this year. Um, he put everything out on the line for you. And Dan Landing seems like he learned his lessons from working at Georgia and is applying them very, very well. Now I may be a little early on them because it definitely, I could see with the way they're recruiting, they could also be amazing in the next few years, but I I'm, I'm close to putting those two right up there with USC. I'm thinking Utah takes a step back and doesn't have a chance to win the Pac-12 with, with those two guys there. Interesting. I was going to ask if, if Utah is being slept on as the two-time defending. I think they, yeah. Champ. The answer is we yes. Have a returning starting quarterback with, with uh, Brent Keithy, who's now back and presumably will be at full strength at the start of this season. Um, and with some budding stars that are younger players, Jaquindon Jackson is a really good running back. Lander Barton started as a true freshman last year at linebacker. Not many people do that. Uh, four and a half sacks, 46 tackles. That guy's a star. Um, so I, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I am going to love watching Pac-12 football after dark this year because a hundred percent, a lot of intrigue. There are going to be some yeah. good teams there. I don't know who to buy here. I think I'm just holding my money and going to regret not going in on someone, but I, well, I can really well, see when we do the win totals, you're going to have to pick somebody. <laughs> I know, and that's 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 where I, I'm going to kick the can down the road because I still need more time to kind of think through it. Because, um, yeah, let's look at the other one that we talked about here with the Huskies of Washington. Let me pull up their schedule real quick. Uh, their schedule sets up pretty nicely outside of a three game stretch at the end, which may be pretty, pretty gnarly here. I'll read it off real quick. Home against Boise state home against Tulsa on the road at Michigan state. That's a W um, home against Cal. That's a W at Arizona. I think you're winning that game. Although Arizona, I think will be feisty. Then you get a bye week Then you play the Oregon ducks at home. And then after that game, which should be, a, you know, a, that, that, that should be a slugfest, right? That's going to be uh, one that I expect to go down to the wire. Uh, it, an emotional hangover game, but you get Arizona State, who I don't expect to do much in year one under Coach Dillingham. Um, at Stanford, so you get uh, two games there that I think are, are – you probably are resting your starters halfway through the third quarter. And then you have this three-game stretch. At USC, home against Utah, at Oregon State. That I think is is where the where the season is decided. Is, is that three game stretch is is going to be really interesting for Washington? Yeah, I I guess they they close. Sorry to just cap off the season. They close at home in the Apple Cup versus Washington State, which I expect them to win. I think that that one's. I, I agree. I don't think Washington State will be a pushover, but if I'm picking a team there, it's certainly uh, the Huskies. Of of these three teams we've mentioned, Washington is a team whose hype I'm buying. And I don't know how well based that is. Um, I, I don't know if this is emotionally me going, gosh, that team's really fun to watch. I'm, so, I'm, you know, now a huge believer in Michael Penix and what he can do. Um, and also I'm just a lover of Kalen DeBoer and what he's done at Fresno and what he's doing now at Washington. I, I do think the Pac-12 gets a, uh, a nice little catch-up period where we've all had a year of, playing against Lincoln Riley. We've all had a year of playing against Kalen DeBoer um, where now we have their, at least a little bit more familiarity with some of the schemes and things that they want to do. Obviously you don't figure out coaches immediately um, and some have your number and they beat you over and over and over again, but it is uh, 
I'd say advantage to the other teams versus last year where they hadn't had the experience playing them. You watch tape, but it's a different thing to, to implement against them. Um, whereas with the Oregon Ducks, you have a new OC there. You got Will Stein coming in from UTSA, if I'm not mistaken, uh, taking over that that team. And that roster has a, a lot of talent, still stocked pretty well from the Mario Cristobal days. Um, but yeah, if, if I have to lean to a team, I, I lean to Washington because I think they have uh, the tools that they need to get it done on the offensive side, certainly. Defensively, I think they're solid. That's the reason I'm not picking USC. I, I, it's no pick against Caleb Williams. I think he's a star. I think he's awesome. I don't think that USC's defense is going to be fixed uh, that quick in year two. I'm a little bit surprised that the DC came back for year two. Um, but uh, are, that, that's are what keeps me from going with them. If we're not thinking Lincoln Riley will make it to the Pac-12 championship, like he's made it to the Pac-12 championship, the Big 12 championship every every other year. <laughs> like, I, I'm not saying he can't. I just I don't think he's going to win it. I don't think he's going to be in the playoff. But I will say, going back to one team that isn't one of our hype teams, but is the two-time defending champs, uh, Jaquindon Jackson, I, I'm so excited to watch this year. He became a running back in the middle of last season. Okay, so this is his first offseason playing running back. We might be in for a real treat for what he does on Saturdays. So uh, not not counting out Kyle Whittingham, not counting out the Utah Utes, because they've done it. They, they've done it when they've been uh, – slept on before and, and they're, they'll do it again. Uh, you just gotta, just gotta keep an eye out for the youths at all times. Yeah. He, he's he may not be the best recruiter, but he has got to be arguably one of the best coaches in, in the game. Absolutely. Does more or less all the time and, and just develops talent. Yeah. Sees it, sees it and projects it. Three but like, even he just knows how to beat it. players. Like watch Mario Cristobal. Well, he had Mario Cristobal's number. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then you have people pop up like Dalton Kincaid, who we didn't know he was going to be absolutely unreal. He was, you know, the backup tight end, but that's the type of thing that Steve's talking about where he, he develops and, and, you know, take, takes the raw material and turns it into something really, really special. And Dalton Kincaid goes and, you know, I don't know if he was first round, but he was early first round, first yeah. round. Um, to the bills. again, started off as a backup last year. Um, so that's the type of talent evaluation that you're getting out of that staff on a consistent basis. I think you have another first rounder at tight end on their roster, who is also their second tight end. I don't Keithy. I don't think has the measurables. No, I don't, I don't think so. The college game, but oh gosh, and now I'm blanking on his name. Their second one it was, it was a rugby player originally. That guy's oh gosh, that's gonna kill me. Go ahead and look that up for me, please. I'll catch that for you. Let let Corey keep the show moving along. That. Yeah, we'll we'll keep going. But that one's. I think they got another. Potential right. first-round tight end. That sounds good. Um, so then, now we're going to go on teams that are not getting the hype, but that are being slept on that you think should get hype a little bit. Um, I don't think we need to go by conference. I just want to hear some of your the, some of the teams that you think are being slept on a little bit, Steve. I Yeah, this is a harder one for me, just because the reason teams are being slept on is because people don't think they're going to be very good. Uh, and so really what it boils down to for me is like teams that have to have one or two things break their, their way. Like, I, I think one that's not being mentioned enough is Kentucky. Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong. There are ways that the season could go off the rails for the Wildcats. But my thought process is they brought back in their previous offensive coordinator who took a year hiatus. He, Liam Cohen was at Kentucky, went to the Rams and is now back at Kentucky. Uh, and, He's a really strong play caller. I question whether or not they've got the offensive line to do what they want to do offensively. That's 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 the uh, the asterisk. He's done it with wide receivers at all, at, at quarterback though. So <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just saying, like that one to me is an under the radar team that could potentially win. I don't know if I see him winning nine games. I need to look at their schedule once again. But Devin Leary's a good quarterback. He's a really good quarterback with a good play caller. And what will be a stout defense. The question is, do they have the offensive line to protect him and to run the football as, you know, as Kentucky is wont to do. So, so do you have them competing to be the second best team in the SEC East or do you have them as the third best team? I've got them between second and third. I, I think Tennessee. So rivaling Tennessee second. is what you're saying. But yeah, I think they could push Tennessee. I think that game is in Lexington too. By the way, DraftKings has the line at six and a half for them. <laughs> Which sounds insanely low compared to what you're saying. 
and don't get me wrong, there's a way that they win four. Like, yeah. that offensive line was really bad last year. But even then, like, they still were within a point of beating Ole Miss on the road. Like, they, they, they there's some opportunity there that I think not many people are talking about it with, yeah. with, with the Wildcats. Anybody else throw, you have as a sleeper team? I'd throw, well, real quick, Steve, is Mickey Suguturaga the tight end you're talking no, about? No, Thomas Yasmin? Thomas That's Yasmin? Yeah. Okay. Senior senior oh. coming up this year from Sydney, Australia. Yes. Okay. Give me that dude all day. Yeah, six foot five. He's, he's got the definitely has the measurables. That's for sure. Um, yeah, you should see some of his highlights. It's not quite there yet, but I think I think this might be his year. All right. Especially when, when they get in those two tight end formations with Grant Keekley lining up in the slot and then being attached. There's there's a lot they can do with those two tight ends as they've proved before. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw Oklahoma in the mix. Uh, Oklahoma had an underwhelming season. Sorry, Corey. Uh, underwhelming season in year one. I, I, I remember in our preseason Big 12 uh, breakdown, or our predictions, I had the Sooners finishing at third, and I said, I think this is the lowest possible finish they could have. Um, just because I thought they were going to be that good. I really thought they were going to be a good team. Uh, just had a couple of stumbles. And really had a, you know a couple of really rough games there against Texas. Um, tough one against uh, Kansas State. Um, but also I watched them play against Florida state in the bowl game and I go, okay, their young running backs have got, got some real talent here. Dylan Gabriel was good when he played, uh, generally speaking, I, I'm a Dylan Gabriel fan. I think, you know, he's, he's got the talent. Um, and Venables is somebody who I believe in as a defensive coach. I think he did exceptional things at Oklahoma previously, exceptional things at Clemson. I don't have any reason to believe that he won't be able to coach this defense well at Oklahoma. Um, and get things a little bit shored up better there. Um, I, I, when I say they should be added to the list of high teams, no, I don't think there's really any chance of them making the playoff this year. I do think they have a decent chance to win win their conference. I think they're going to pose a threat to every team that they they come across. Um, and, and if they catch you in, in New Year's Six Bowl, uh, watch out, Brian. I, you and I have the same brain. Literally, I had OU as my team that was coming up from the from the bottom here. Um, Javante Barnes, like that running back is insane. Just those, like just watching them play against Florida State. Florida State wanted to win a tenth game. Like they wanted, they brought everybody back. Yeah, and, had no know, opt outs. Honestly, yeah, had no opt outs, and probably should have won that game. And and basically, it gave an opportunity for Oklahoma to really test their talent and to really see what they could do. And that team has depth. They, that team has talent. And this year, I do have them competing with Texas. In, in, to potentially win the Big Twelve, um, do they have a defense? That's my question. I, like that, that's Ryan, where my faith is in Venables. It's it's not and it's not something I've seen. You don't need a defense. You have to outscore people. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. I think I think they've got a good tandem. You mentioned Javante Barnes, Gavin Sachuk looked, frankly, like I had only seen some high school tape of him, and I think he's was he a true freshman last year? Maybe I believe so. Richard. True freshman. Either way, the strength and conditioning program has done very well for him at at Oklahoma, and he ran way more physical against Florida State than I anticipated. I hadn't I hadn't watched a ton of Oklahoma you know, prior to that game. There wasn't a whole lot of reason to, frankly, after they got blasted by a few different teams. But um, they've got some really promising young talent, uh, and I think with a little bit better injury luck, and and even now, like you saw what happened last year when. Dylan Gabriel went down. They had no solutions. There's a lot of buzz about the true freshman QB they have as their number two right now in Jackson Arnold. So uh, I think you may have the uh, a solution or at least a you know kind of some sort of stopgap so that your season doesn't become uh, a complete wash when it, or should should something happen to Dylan Dylan Gabriel. Um, my St- my other two other uh, Brian, do you have another sleeper sleeper team? No, you go ahead. Okay, my other one, I have two other sleeper teams, so I'll just do one of them. Um, my other one that we kind of talked a little bit about was Oregon that I think is, is 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 people are sleeping on them a little bit. I don't think they give them a shot to win to be in the big or in the Pac-12 championship. I think there's a shot there, but I have a sleeper team that's a good team, but people are disrespecting them, including Stephen Bama here. Um, I think there's Stephen doesn't have any way Bama wins gets to the SEC championship, let alone gets to the playoff, and I'm like. 
can we really doubt Nick Saban? Now, I don't love the hires. I don't love the Kevin Steele hire. I'm not a huge fan of the Tommy Reese hire. Um, but I think there's no way that he doesn't whip that defense into shape and let them play Alabama defense and that they have an opportunity to, to pl- be significantly better. I think he's not going to let Kevin Steele decide a lot of things that happen. I think he's going to be hands-on a lot more than than we expect uh, or than you would be expected with an offensive or defensive coordinator. So I expect them to give LSU a good chance for the run for their money. I think they probably beat LSU this next year. And I think they do make it back to the SEC championship. Now, whether they beat Georgia or not, who knows, but I don't think the drop into Texas. I don't think, I don't know. We'll I'm see. intrigued but, to see, uh, to see Tommy Reese in year one there. Um, you know, he went back and got Tyler Buckner from Notre Dame who he spent, uh, I don't know, two weeks trying to recruit somebody to replace him but for the Hart- Will Hartman. Uh, remember that Tommy Reese hire came later. So th- that's something that you have to consider is they didn't want Buckner to be their starting quarterback in Notre Dame. And now it's like, well, that's better than what we got here. Uh, I've seen it. So we're, we'll, we'll bring him in. I don't think that bodes particularly well, um, which is part of the reason I have pause for the team overall. Again, talent level is as high as it's ever been. It, it or not, I shouldn't say that, but uh, you know, as high as Alabama you'd expect um, for the most part, I, I think at the prospect, the people that they have brought in, in the recruiting classes, um, hasn't really had a significant dip. Yes, you've had additional competition with Georgia. Um, so there's always a chance you bring out that talent, but I, particularly at the quarterback position, I, you might have your hands tied just a little bit. So are you guys predicting three, four losses for Bama this year? No, um, I'm not predicting that. I, I, there are, I think by my account right now, Four losable games. One, two, three, four, maybe five. I don't know if I'd buy five. Here, we'll run through their schedule real quick, and I'll, I'll point out the ones that I think are are like or like potential losses or ones that there's there's less or like more than a twenty five percent chance that they lose. Yeah, let's talk about How's it. How's that, Tom? Okay, uh, first one: Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders. It's not a losable game, but just remember that team lit up the Kevin Steele defense last year. So who knows? I'm, that is tongue not, in cheek. not true. Tongue in cheek, but but I'm just saying. So no, they lose that. But Texas definitely a possibility at USF. I don't think so. Home against Ole Miss, not likely. At Mississippi State, I think they have the defense. If you have to run the football. I don't trust the Bama quarterbacks to throw the football right now, and I'm not sure I trust the receivers to make plays on the outside either. So if you have to run the football, I think they have the defensive line and they get you at home. All right. But that one to me is, is more of a question mark than, than maybe it will be for others. The the one thing that I have on the Mississippi State side of Mississippi State side of the ledger is how does Will Rogers adjust to a, a new offense that isn't spread him five wide and chuck the ball around. So that part gives me some pause, but I think defensively they, they, they can potentially give Bama some, some trouble, especially if they force, force you to throw the football. Now maybe Alabama has the offensive line to just say, no, we're, we're just bigger, stronger, faster uh, at the point of attack. And, and we can just run the football and get four yards of carry. We'll see. But they follow up that road game with at Texas A&M, who definitely has the horses on the defensive line to make that interesting if you can't throw the football. Well, and if any any assistant coach ever has a problem with Nick Saban or has a chance to beat Nick Saban, it is Jimbo Fisher. They play him tough every year. Yeah, he, he game plans. We talked about this in the past. He's He gets ready for those games and brings his best there. Then after that, that's two really physical matchups, and you follow that with the Razorbacks of Arkansas, who, again – aren't a good team or aren't a great team, but they they'll hit you in the mouth. Like that, that's, that is a, uh, as far as from a physicality standpoint, a really rough three game stretch. And then you have to go and play the Tennessee, Tennessee volunteers at, you're at home, but it's the fourth game of that four game stretch. It's rough by week. And then, then you're home against LSU. You do get two of your major rivals and two of the ones that are again on our hyped team list of Tennessee and LSU both at home and straddling a bye week, but there, I, I can see quite a few losses in there. After that, they're at Kentucky. I don't see them really challenging them. Home against Chattanooga and then at Auburn. Uh, again, I don't think Auburn's going to do a whole lot in, in year one. We've talked about that, but it wouldn't stun me if, if Hugh Freeze is just like, okay, the three weeks before it, if the season's a wash, the only way I can redeem it is by beating 
Bama, and I ha- have home field, and I just need to s- scheme up five, five or six wide open plays that I can score me a sixty yard touchdown and give me a chance. Well, and and they do have Auburn has a preferable schedule leading into that. They play at Vanderbilt, at Arkansas, and then New Mexico State. So it's like, hey, we might have a little chance to kind of take a little bit of time off of fo- focusing for Vanderbilt and New Mexico State and focus on Alabama. Yeah, I, my thing is is. Saban has proven time and time again that he can do it. The one thing that we, I think everybody has is there are more questions here with starters, et cetera, than there have been in, in the past and, and with new coordinators than there ever has been. Um, and so that's the, that's the biggest question mark. But I'm not writing them off. LSU's beat them one time. They've got to prove it again. I mean, LSU's beat them, I think, what, it's been three times since, or four times since in the Saban area, Saban area, maybe six even. Who knows? Um, I saw a statistic out there the other day, but um, but Brian Kelly hasn't proven that he can beat Saban consistently. We we saw that in the playoffs. We've seen a one point win against them in okay uh, in one game. I'm I'm not sold that they can beat them consistently. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm a more consistent Brian Kelly believer uh, than than Corey is. Um, Steve, uh, while we're talking about teams that we thought might have been hyped, uh, I'm surprised you didn't talk about Lubbock at all. Um, you know, there's there's a program there that runs dear to your heart and <laughs> should be pretty decent. Guns up, guns up. Yeah, I I feel like they are getting plenty of hype for for you know for where what's I don't even want to say what's realistic. I, no one I think is proclaiming them as a as a Big Twelve title contender, but they do have I think a nine. Their win total is is nine. Is that right? I, I think they're getting plenty of respect. Let's put it that way. Maybe not a lot of hype. My thing is like, I quarterback play has got to be better there, right? Like the rest of that team, I think is is good, and I'm really excited about. Is it Zach Kittle, their new uh, offensive coordinator from Western Kentucky? Uh, Brian, or Steve, the line for Texas Tech is that really in the for wins? Yeah, What's seven and a half total. Seven and a half. Well, that's low. That's low for me. I want eight or eight and a half. It's so Zach like Kittley. But the old why I'm into that. Zach Kittley. Sorry, my my apologies. Who all he does is put up points. So uh, I think he will try and get. Obviously, he'll try and get the most out. But I think he will get the most out of the QBs there, Donovan Smith and Tyler Shuck. Um, I I just am not sure that you've got a real game changer at QB there. Um, and so I, I might need to see something there. Um, but, hey, their recruiting's better than it's ever been and, and continues to be very impressive. I'm telling you, if Jimbo Fisher doesn't work out at a and or if Sark doesn't work out at Texas, he's going to have one of those two jobs in the next three years. All right. Write it down. You hear here first. If you got odds yeah. on it, go, go get them. Oh, yeah. All right. I say then let's move on to the next piece. Um, we'll try to be quick about this. We've been a little while in. Um, NBA finals are going on right now. If you had to pick an NBA player to build a team around, who would you pick? What position and why? Let's be fast about it, though. College football team, right? That's kind of yeah, you pick, you bring them into college football. Sure. You put them in the pros. Okay. You want me to go first? Go ahead, Steve. I got two, and I, I like the big men. So uh, I think. Jokic, or however you pronounce his last name, I am not a big basketball fan, but I see that frame and I see how he moves, and that is an awesome offensive tackle. <laughs> and you could probably slip him out on like on a route or something, get him into like I guess in the in the NFL you'd have to have him have a pass catching number, but in college football you could probably do similar to what Florida State did with Marquiston Douglas in the bowl game against Oklahoma, where he lines up as the left tackle, but he's pass eligible because of how you've your alignment. Uh, that, that's a that's a nasty nasty weapon that you could use here and there but i'd see that guy being an awesome offensive tackle the other one i thought outside of the box here for a couple of reasons give me udonis haslam <laughs> and, and hear me out here like number one in his early years i'm assuming i'd get him when he was a college player he at florida was the enforcer on that team and not only that He's a pro's pro. He's been in the league 20 years. He's really good, well-respected in the locker room. He's going to make sure that everyone's held accountable to the standard. They talk about heat culture all the time. It's Udonis Haslam that makes that go. So I need that guy. It's I true. need a guy that's going to build my program and going to take 
the younger players under his wing say, this is how we do things here. Going to keep people in line so I don't have any knuckleheads that maybe get too big for their britches. And that's, that's a guy you need in the locker room. So that was my other vote. In fact, it was actually my first. Um, but if we're talking about actually playing football, probably probably Jokic and give, give me him as my left tackle. I love love the length in his arms. So you've got to fill him out a little bit, but we could do that. Yeah, I think he's like 6'11", 284. But still, yeah, you can put some weight on him. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll go ahead. Not? Yeah. Uh, so I was tempted for a second to to go with one of the the big men, Kevin Love or Jokic. Uh, for those of you who are basketball lovers, those are the two best outlet passers in all of the game, uh, in the history of the game. And so I thought, you know, they'd be tempting to put one of them in at quarterback um, and see the spectacle of a seven footer or six nine guy playing quarterback. Um, the other temptation was for me to put Jamal Murray at quarterback because I think he is just a really elite athlete, really good ball handler, makes good decisions can hurt you himself or can, can get things to other people. But I'm going to go with Aaron Gordon. Aaron Gordon, six foot nine, got loads of length. I want him at defensive end. He is coming at your, <laughs> at your quarterback, and you will not be able to stop him. He's extremely explosive. He's strong. He's, I think he's about 250. He's got a big, you know, a, a lot of muscle on his body, um, but also just uh, extreme speed. Um, he's still, to this day, he's been dunking in the league for a long time, still doing it. Should have two, uh, two slam dunk champ or er, titles uh got robbed on both but I, I don't see him as blockable by any means throw him at defensive end that's my pick when you said him i thought tight end but defensive end seems pretty nasty too i mean the i think he'd do is... he'd do fair at either yeah okay so my first two options were jamal murray at quarterback and aaron gordon at defensive end literally <laughs> have it written down. so i'm gonna go with jimmy butler and i don't know whether to put him as a wide receiver or a quarterback I might put him as a quarterback because he's going to drag you to two or three wins that you just don't deserve because <laughs> that guy has put so much heart and has fought his way in. I mean, originally out of high school, he went to like a lower Texas division like school and then transferred over to Marquette and wasn't expected to be an all-star and kind of just grew over, grew it at, at the, at the bulls over at Chicago. And now has become a full fledged all-star. Like that boy is going to work hard and he's going to drag your team where it needs to go, even when they shouldn't be, you know, even when they're the eighth seed, they're going to go to the finals. So, well, and the thing I love about Jimmy Butler is you always see him consistently in the postseason when things matter the most. He doesn't just stay consistent; he ups his game, you know. Yeah. And that, that's the type of person who can get you over the hump. Um, and that's you know where where Tom Brady gets you know his reputation from. Yes, it's from the quantity of rings, but it's because when it comes down to that last minute or when it's in the playoffs, you know exactly what to expect from Tom Brady. I, Jimmy Butler has a very similar. Or uh, not not a greatest of all time aura, but a hey, he's gonna be at his very very best when it matters. No, he literally has a persona that people that he denies of of playoff Jimmy. So yeah, all right, we'll go on to our next segment: the place that you've been or like experiences in the stadium that you've had, uh, best experience you've ever had in in the stadium live. I'll start this off. So I actually had a lot of experiences in stadiums, but. A lot of times, just because I was working them, I worked concessions from like 2002 to 2000, like five or six, um, at the FSU games. But I would only come out for like the beginning or the ending. So my actual favorite experience is one that I actually got to experience over at BYU. Um, Florida State comes into unranked in 2009. BYU's ranked seventh or ninth, depending <laughs> on who you talk to. And we have a great tailgate party outside of the Florida uh, BYU game. For those of you who are familiar with BYU, they don't really have tailgating very much there. So Florida State decides, a bunch of fans decide to build, have a tailgate outside. The FSU Seminole uh, cheerleaders come over and hang out with us a little bit. Um, we we go all go over and greet the Florida State football team. And then I sit in the student section dressed in garnet and gold and proceed to watch Florida State knock the socks off of BYU. And all the BYU fans are super crying because it was literally the first time I think BYU, I'd seen BYU ever lose at home. In, in my time at, at, at BYU. Um, and I loved it. I like every time the team I was rooting for won. So it was a great game. <laughs> Steve? I have. Oh, go, Brian. Yeah, I have three uh, experiences that I'll touch on two briefly and then I'll go a little bit more in one. One I've talked about before Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams running all over Texas and getting Manny Diaz fired from there. Being there. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, that was... storm game, uh, we're sticking around for. Um, another one is one I went to with Steve. It was a BYU Toledo game. That was a shootout. Oh, I think yeah, BYU won 57, 55. 
and there's this running back that's running all over BYU. And I'm like, come on, you guys can't stop this dude. Turns out that's Kareem Hunt. Nobody else can yeah. stop him either. He's, he's a really talented player. Um, but BYU wins it again at the, you know, clock expiring with a field goal. Um, but uh, the game I'm going to talk about is 2012 FSU Clemson uh, in Dope Campbell Stadium. Uh, this is not the championship year of 2013 where they destroy him in Death Valley, but a, a two teams that are loaded just, just to the gills with NFL talent. You've got EJ Manuel and Xavier Rhodes, Chris Thompson uh, on, on the Florida State side, LaMarcus Joyner. Um, you, I mean, there's a lot. Telvin Smith's on there. Christian Jones. Uh, I think this might still have Vince Williams this year. Dang Maybe he's doing 11. Jorn Werner. Mm-hmm. Um, Brandon Jenkins. All on that same team. Uh, did you say LaMarcus Joyner? LaMarcus Joyner, yeah, I did. And, and on the Clemson side, you have uh, Taj Boyd, who at you know, in the early parts of the season was thought of as a Heisman contender, but he's thrown to DeAndre Hopkins and Sammy Watkins, and he's got Andre Ellenson in the backfield. Um, it was awesome. FSU was down 21-14 at half. And, Dwayne and, Allen's their tight end, too. Right, like, right. Dwayne Allen is the tight end on that so team. Good. Yeah, and he, he had a couple touchdowns in that game. Um, but, yeah, it was a phenomenal game. FSU has the comeback uh, win and kind of runs away with it. We also get some of our first glimpses of Kelvin Benjamin. He's running end arounds um, randomly. Uh, but uh, it, it was it was awesome to watch. Um, great to be in there for the stadium. So, And that was, you know, there was a, a handful of years where Clemson was pushing up against Florida State for a while to, to take over in the ACC. Um, and they had a lot of talented teams. So that was one where, where Florida State was able to stave it off and, and stay as king for a little bit. Did you mention Vic Beasley on the defense for? I don't think I did. The, the, I yeah. mean, the, those rosters were were loaded with you NFL go, talent. Go back and watch that game and be just like, wow, there's a yeah. lot of guys that played at the next level for a and, very long time. And with all the talent, Nick Waysom is the guy who ends up getting the pick that's really decisive in the game. You know, like <laughs> Nick Waysom was a good recruit, had like three good games maybe for Florida State. Uh, but, but you know, he's got Ronald Darby and PJ Williams who are, you know, NFL players backing him up at cornerback. So, uh, yeah, just a, just a wild thing to watch. All right. I had a couple. I, I When you first led into that Clemson game, I thought you were talking about one. You said that was an experience with you and I. I was not there in 2012. Oh, sorry. The 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 Toledo, just the Toledo BYU game. Oh, that's game. right. Excuse okay. me. I, I got it mixed up. That's right. Um, but the one that I had from you and I was the third and 28 Florida State versus Oklahoma to open the season or the second game of the year. Are you talking about wow. the pass to Rashad? Yes. Oh my yes. God. Clint Trickett. Yes. So you guys went to that game? We were at that game. We were at that game and we were not that high up. We were in the end zone, but we were in the opposite end zone. He scores on the far side of the field. Um, I just remember, I like, I remember it's third and 28. So it set the scene for you. It's third and 28. There is nine minutes and 48 seconds left on the clock. And they are down seven. This is number five, Florida State. Again, they were a year. The hype was, I think, a year early. And this is this is 2011. 2011. Yeah. This is 2011. In 2012, they end up winning the ACC. They end up falling short of kind of their ultimate goals. I think they. they yeah, because they lose to NC they State, were, I think. They lose, they lose to NC State, State and they, and they choke against Florida. Florida. Yeah, like yeah, a five yeah, turnover game there. But again, this is another one where, like, I think the hype was a year ahead of schedule, a year premature. So preseason ranked number five, Florida State versus Oklahoma, who was preseason ranked number one. Landry Jones was their quarterback. Uh, their big stars were uh, Kenny Stills. Uh, Tom Wart was one of their linebackers who just had a heck of a game. Uh, really a, a fun kind of back and forth game. EJ Manuel gets knocked out of this game. And Clint Trickett has looked pretty poor most of the game that far, that that far to that point. His first drive, I think he led a field goal field goal drive. And then after that, the defense uh, from Oklahoma kind of got reestablished, resettled in, and, and they hadn't done anything. And it's on third and 28 that he throws a, I don't even actually have the it's number. Like, oh, it's a prayer. 56. <laughs> yeah, it's a prayer. It's a 56 yard touchdown. I remember he lets it go. And some guy behind us like, not into triple coverage. Like, <laughs> just like, just, you can hear that. And then when Rashad Green catches the ball and the uh, Oklahoma safety re- you know, takes a bad angle. He just walks into the end zone, basically. Like, everyone else misplayed the ball. Um, and, and that place, I could not hear Brian right next to me. We were, like, talking, trying to talk to each other. That's the loudest I've ever been in a stadium. I know they end up going on to lose that game. That was one of the coolest moments I have been in a stadium for. I have heard from – so FSU Twitter is very, very, like, like 
they talk a ton on Twitter and there's a lot. And every I, a lot lately, a lot of play, people have said that was the loudest game they've ever been to. So you aren't the only was, person that said it that. It was awesome. It was yeah. so loud. Unbelievably one good. Point, I think we forced three straight false starts like, when they were – gonna punt right on like yeah backed up and that's the part that everybody references yep yeah so it was super loud it was i think the best showing from the florida state faithful ever i mean it not to say that we're a poor fan base but like that was us at our apex yeah it's kind of interesting because we're starting to come back versus whatever i had some great seats in like 05 and 06 because the girl i hung out with her dad wrote the fsu fight song so i'd go in the seventh row or like in the 20 30 yard line or the second row in the 50 yard line because i go to the games with her but we weren't a good team then, so it wasn't like amazing to watch. Yeah, no, yeah. I I remember being at that game and just you also had Ryan Broyles playing for for Oklahoma at the Ryan time, Broyles, who was yeah. an absolute stud wide receiver. I missed him, sorry. Thanks. Um, and, and the other like big play I remember from that is I think it ended up getting flagged, but Kenny Stills makes this ridiculous catch on the sideline, but gets concussed by I think Lamarcus Joyner. Um, it, there's a there's a crazy hit that happens and the whole fan base goes crazy until I realize oh my gosh he held on to that thing, um, but yeah that was a, a, an unbelievable game to be at and the wing gets taken out of sales for just a second with EJ going down uh, but gosh I, I yeah that that was definitely like as far as atmosphere goes like one of the craziest things I've ever been in in my entire life not just uh, in college football sphere. Okay, all right so we're Hold reaching. On. I got I got oh, two right. more sorry real fast. <laughs> Um, so since I've been out here, two fun ones that I've had, uh, BYU beating USC in overtime in 2019. This is Keaton Slovis's freshman year at Florida or at Florida State at USC. He's having a great season. Uh, USC was not having a great season. They end up going on to, I think they're seven and six on the year, but he ends up throwing an interception in the second part of first overtime to seal the win. Uh, Kairos Tonga from his defensive tackle position took over that game. And that was when I was like, you, you, you got yourself an NFL defensive tackle here. Uh, I, I, you'd seen glimpses of it before, but like that was where it's like, okay, that center just cannot block him. And every time that he's, you know, he's out there every play. So I, I don't expect him to go full bore every single play, but every play that he gave maximum effort, I'm not, I'm not accusing him of loafing. I'm just saying probably had to pace himself throughout the game. Uh, it was apparent that that guy just could not handle him. They doubled him, nothing doing. Uh, the last one, uh, seeing BYU beat Utah so to prevent a 10-game <laughs> win streak in that rivalry uh, was mostly fun because obviously the, the fan bases are so close. There's plenty of Utah fans in the crowd. Um, and there were some to our right that were just absolutely the worst to deal with. And... They left before, like, Utah made it interesting after they left. They left right as it started to rain. I don't know if you'll remember that. The rain started coming down basically right at the end of the third quarter, start of the fourth quarter. Utah makes a charge in that that end part. But I, it's funny, I deliberately said to a different Utah fan, I was like, do, do they not know that there's four quarters in a game? They, they're giving up already? Is that what y'all do? Like, Because uh, I've had it. I, I that, That's one of those things where I, I have to be careful at games like I, I, get uh very competitive and if you're wearing the wrong colors it becomes a problem so <laughs> i gotta be careful all right i think we're gonna skip our uh tips for for how to survive the off season due to time we'll pick up on that one later um and go to parting shots any party shots at all uh this is not so much a parting shot but i'll share one of my least favorite experiences in a uh in a stadium um I'm, I'm sure it was with me this time huh no, I did have a, an experience where I almost passed out at a baseball game with Corey, a college baseball yeah. game. Um, that one was cool because he, he flicked water. So he takes me underneath the stadium, flicks water on my face, and has me chugging water. Um, I, I've never had anything like it. It was just super hot day in Tallahassee, and I'm sweating like crazy. And by the time I stand up to like go like underneath and get some shade, like everything's going like real bright in my vision, and my ears are starting to ring. Um, and Corey's like, yo, do you want to go home? Like, we'll just get out of here. I'm like, no, let's stick around for the end. Um, they're playing Vanderbilt and it was either regionals or super regionals, but, uh, walk off yeah, on run remember. from, um, oh gosh, you hit it. It wasn't Tyler Holt. It was it's that same team, Nothing Tyler more. Holt and Sherman both swing for the fences in, in the bottom of the ninth and, and get caught on the warning track, both of them. And then, oh my gosh, I don't remember his name. Mike McGee. Is it oh, Mike, Mike McGee? McGee. 
he rakes out a homer with two outs in the bottom of the ninth uh, for the win. So it was awesome, awesome. No, I was going to say uh, 2008, and this is purely based on fandom. 2008, uh, I go to a Florida State, Florida game. Uh, this is Tim Tebow in his junior se- season, the year that Florida, his second uh, championship with the Gators. Um, and it is pouring rain. This game was delayed for a long time. Uh, Mark and I got tickets to it because somebody who we knew was just like, yeah, I'm not going. Like, it's miserable weather. We're not doing that. We're like, sweet, we'll take free tickets, of course. And we go and we just, I mean, the rain doesn't stop the whole game. doesn't let up. Um, This is the same. If you ever see pictures of Tim Tebow with a white Florida jersey on and he's got the uh, red all over, it looks like it's blood, but it's it's not. It's actually red from FSU's end zone um, all over his shoulder pad. Um, it's a really cool picture, I'm sure, if you like him and like the Gators. Um, but as somebody who grew up just just presenting everything about it, uh, brutal. So the rain just beats down on you all all day. FSU can't get anything right on the on the day. They're dropping really out like open passes. Um, everything's just mixed up, and we lose. I think 45 to 15. Um, and I think we stayed to the bitter bitter end of it. But it was brutal. And and, and it was we weren't expected to win. But I want to say Florida State was. Like maybe number twenty at, at that point, so it, it was a ranked matchup. We're going up against the Gators. Um, it was the same year as the the Tebow speech, but that that was by far the worst. You you go out there, you get rained on all day. It's cold. It's miserable. It's a, you know late November, uh, and then you just get the crap beat out of you, and your team doesn't look like they sh- wanted to show up. I don't actually blame the players, but it's just ugh. like I I can't imagine a way to have made my Saturday worse than what I did. You just remind me. I actually went to the FSU South Carolina game. Uh, that was like the Peach Bowl, when oh. um, when uh, Greg Reed Mark knocks out Marcus Lattimore, Marshawn. That was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Marcus. It's Marcus. Is, it, is it Marcus? Yeah. yeah. Um, and Mark, our brother, refused to go with me. So me and Julian went <laughs> with my mom. <laughs> No, that was, I, I watched the highlights from that game just recently because um, I remember Greg Reed was Alshon Jeffrey, right? He was the first round pick out of South Carolina, awesome wide receiver. You know, you had some some good tools on that offense, and Greg Reed locked him up the whole day. And, and like the, I, I don't remember how many catches Alshon Jeffrey got, but like it was like, oh, you caught one for the first down, cool. I'm stripping it right now. We're gonna take it away. Um, Greg Reed was all over him all game. Uh, that that was a really phenomenal one. Yeah. Any party shot, Steve? I, I really don't. We're getting into those dog days of summer where not enough is going on. I got some. Get ready for Florida State to win the College World Series for softball right now. They're playing Oklahoma State currently as we speak. They're up seven nothing. This team has this team has been built to be ready for this. They've played Oklahoma. They played Oklahoma State. They played UCLA. You're looking at three of the top six teams this year. They've already played them before they got to the World Series. This team is built to withstand this, and it's going to happen. So mark it on your calendars. Get ready for it. It's going to be exciting. We'll see if they can. They can. I mean, you got to get to Oklahoma first, but then you got to. No, no, we're in Oklahoma right now. Well, I'm saying you have to get to the team, Oklahoma. Oh yeah, yeah. Who's on the opposite side of the bracket? Who's yeah. only lost once this year? So you got to get to them, and you got to beat them twice. We played know. them very, very tight in Oklahoma this year. Yeah. So to one run, we lost by yeah. one run. So we'll see. All right. That's it for us. Y'all take care. Follow us on socials and have a good one. Peace.